One important measure of the strength of intermolecular forces is the boiling point. Uh, but we haven't really defined exactly what the boiling point is and why boiling occurs. So we're going to spend some time talking about that today. Then we're going to do a little quiz, Ken, where we try to apply what we've learned about the relationship between molecular structure and the intermolecular forces that hold solids and liquids together. Then we're going to look at energy as it relates to phase change. And first of all, we're going to look at general energy and phase change for all the phase changes. And then we're going to focus in on that relationship between temperature and vapor pressure. Finally, today we'll end up with a look at something called a phase diagram. And a phase diagram is a sort of a graphical way of organizing and keeping track of what phase a substance will be in at any temperature and pressure. We usually think about phase changes happening when temperature changes, but it turns out that pressure changes can also cause phase change. So let's get started by talking about boiling point. What is the boiling point? Well, if we look at this picture that we've got here, this is a hot plate that's on, and um, there's water or some liquid in the beaker. And what's pushing down at the surface of the liquid is the atmospheric pressure. When water boils, if you're observant, you've noticed there are bubbles of what you probably have thought is air inside the liquid that rise to the surface, and that continues as long as it's boiling. Those bubbles are not bubbles of air. Those are bubbles of water. So the liquid, whatever what liquid it is, water in this case, is kind of evaporating into itself and creating its own space, its own bubble of its own gas. When the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure, there's enough force there that it can push back against the atmosphere and create those bubbles. And so the boiling temperature or the boiling point, we say, is the temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So going back to this diagram that has three different substances on here, temperature versus vapor pressure, well, you may have noticed earlier that at 760 tor, there was a dotted line over there. That's a special place because that's normal atmospheric pressure. And so if you look across this line, you can see that diethyl ether boils at 34.6 degrees C. How do we know that? Well, that's because vapor pressure for diethyl ether is at atmospheric pressure. And that's, if you read down on the graph, about 34.6 degrees C. Ethanol boils at 78, and water boils at 100. It's not a coincidence that 100 degrees happens to be where this crosses the line, the 760 Tor line. That's the boiling point. It means that the vapor pressure of water is now big enough to push back against one atmosphere of pressure. Now, of course, the boiling point isn't always at that vapor pressure. Sometimes the vapor pressure is lower, sometimes it's higher. So in places like high mountains where the, where the atmospheric pressure is much lower, the boiling point is also lower. So let's say you're at the top of a mountain and the atmospheric pressure is 400 torr. If we follow this line across, we can see what water will boil at under those conditions. Following down, we find out that about 85 degrees is what water would boil at. So if you're at high elevations, you're not going to be able to cook your food as fast because it's just not as hot. So people compensate for that by using things like pressure cookers that elevate the pressure and make it artificially high. You can also raise the boiling point much higher than 100 degrees C by making the pressure higher. So a pressure cooker used at normal atmospheric conditions, like 760 Tor, can be used to raise the boiling point of water much higher. And people who can their own food uh, at home, for example, use pressure cookers to make sure that it gets hot enough to kill bacteria that can survive at 100 degrees C and would be able to live through just normal boiling water. Well, here's a quiz, Ken. We're going to take a look at three different structures here. The first one is butane, C4H10. You can see a picture of it here. The turquoise colored molecules are carbons, and the, and the whitish gray ones are hydrogens in this molecule. Of course, it's all nonpolar because it's a hydrocarbon. The only bonds are CCs and CHs. Here's what its use is. As you probably know, it's used in cigarette lighters. And in those cigarette lighters, the liquid butane, unvaporized butane, can be stored in a plastic container. Here's propane, C3H8. The structure looks real similar, except it's not as long. So it's nonpolar as well. 
This is used in home heating and cooking fuel, and some people hook it up to their grills. And as a liquid, it can be stored, but it has to be in a heavy steel tank. So it wouldn't be storable in a plastic cigarette lighter, for example. And then this is methane. Methane is only a single carbon hydrocarbon, CH4. This is used for home heating and cooking fuel as well. But it's usually sold as a gas, and it can be piped around, transported above or below ground in pipes in any type of weather. Now, thinking about those structures, what I'd like you to do is answer this question. Based on those molecular structures, why would each of these gases be selected for the applications and storage methods that we saw above? Stop the video and think about it, and then I'll try and provide an answer. Well, if you think about it, all of these things have, for intermolecular forces, only London dispersion forces. Now, what makes London dispersion forces stronger or weaker? The longer the molecule, the stronger the London dispersion forces. We saw that earlier. So out of these three, the longest one is butane. And the shortest one is methane. So methane is going to have a very high vapor pressure. Propane will be in the middle, and butane will have the lowest vapor pressure of the three because butane has the strongest London dispersion forces, and that's going to keep it together as a liquid. So I can put butane in a plastic cigarette lighter, and it'll vaporize and reach its equilibrium vapor pressure, but that pressure won't be high enough to blow up that flimsy plastic case. Propane is a little bit shorter, and so its London dispersion forces are weaker. Because it has lower IMFs, that means it vaporizes and reaches a higher vapor pressure than butane. And so you can't put it in a plastic bottle. You have to put it in a steel container. Methane has the weakest intermolecular forces of all because it's so small and its London dispersion forces are very weak. That means it's going to be a gas under almost all conditions. So you can pipe it around in pipes, but you will not be able to compress it very easily and turn it into a liquid. Butane has high enough London dispersion forces that if it gets really cold out, if it gets to be 40 below or even 30 below, a cigarette lighter won't work very well. So they mix a little bit of propane in with it because it has a higher vapor pressure and it will gasify at lower temperatures. Let's talk generally about the energetics of phase change. And the vehicle that we're going to use to talk about this is a heating curve for water. Now, almost all crystalline substances have a similar curve like this. And water is just a good example to use because we know about its melting and boiling point. It's very familiar. So at normal atmospheric pressures, this is the graph of time. If, or I would like to replace this time with, with Q or for heat. So this is heat added as you go on this axis because it wouldn't have to follow time necessarily. And on the vertical axis is temperature in degrees C. Now if I start out down here, cold, with frozen water, ice, at 20 below, what will happen as I add energy, as I move over on the Q-axis, is I'll have a straight line relationship, and the temperature will go up in direct proportion to how much energy has been added. What's happening during this section of the curve is that the energy that's being added is being used just to make the particles jiggle faster. It's only being used to increase the kinetic energy of the particles that are in the solid phase. Once I reach the melting point of water, which is zero degrees C, then I have ice and water together in a mixture, in dynamic equilibrium, and it stays at that temperature until all of the ice has melted. I'm clearly adding energy. In this segment from here to here, there's been an increase in Q, but there's no increase in temperature. Why does that happen? Well, the energy isn't being used to increase kinetic energy, which is temperature. It's being used instead to increase potential energy. So here are two particles that are close together. As I move those particles farther apart, because they're attractive to each other, there's an energy input. An increase happens in PE here as this pro process takes place. Once the water's all melted, well, then my energy goes into increasing the kinetic energy of the water particles, and I see another straight line segment on this curve until I get to my next phase change. Once I'm at 100 degrees C, 
the particles start to get moved further apart. So now I have my liquid particles that are a little bit far apart, and I'm moving them so that one of them is much farther apart from the others. That means I've vaporized it. I've turned it into a vapor or a gas. That takes a lot of energy. And so during this segment from here to here, the energy that I've added, this additional Q, goes into increasing the potential energy, but not the kinetic energy, so the temperature doesn't go up until all the water has boiled. Once the water is boiled, again, I have an increase in kinetic energy or an increase in temperature as I add more Q, more heat. Zeroing in on the part where the melting occurred, we can define a term that's in use in phase change energetics called molar heat of fusion. Molar heat of fusion, or molar enthalpy change of fusion, you might say, more technically correct, is equal to the energy that's absorbed to melt one mole of a substance. So for water, that's this part on the graph, from there to there, it turns out to be 6.008 kilojoules for every mole of water that melts. Now, of course, that's also the amount of energy that would be released if we went the other way. So if we have a mole of liquid water and we freeze it, we would have to take out 6 kilojoules for every mole that froze. At the top of that graph, we had the molar heat of vaporization. Now, of course, that means how much energy is absorbed to vaporize one mole of that substance. In the case of water, the amount of energy it takes to go from liquid water to water vapor is 40.79 kilojoules for every mole. Notice how much bigger that is. It's nearly six times as large as the molar heat of fusion. It takes a lot more energy to move the particles way apart into the gas phase than it takes to move them a little bit apart into the liquid phase. The molar heat of sublimation would then just be the energy absorbed to sublime one mole of a substance. And you could find it by just taking the molar heat of fusion, how much it would take to melt it, and adding it to the molar heat of vaporization. That would be the enthalpy of sublimation. We're going to go through a little review here, review natural logarithms, because we're going to have to use them in the upcoming section. And it might have been a while for some of you since you've seen this in a math class. Natural logarithms are based around this number e. e is one of those crazy numbers like pi that shows up in lots of different places. And it's also, like pi, a number that we don't know exactly. So it's 2.7182818. Not many people know what that number is because we don't really use it. Here's the context that we understand natural logarithms in. This is the definition of a natural logarithm. If y is equal to e raised to the some number x, then we say that the natural logarithm of y is x. So the natural logarithm of a number is the number to which you must raise e to get that number. Probably more important for our purposes are some of the rules that we use for dealing with natural logarithms. Like here is a rule that can simplify some things and make them more handy for us. The natural log of a number minus the natural log of another number is equal to the natural log of the first number divided by the second number. And the natural log of a number plus the natural log of another number is equal to the natural log of those two numbers multiplied together. So here's where this is going to come in handy. We're looking at a graph that we've seen before, several times actually. And this is the relationship between the equilibrium vapor pressure of a substance and the temperature. And we can see that this is not a linear relationship. So what is the nature of that relationship? Well, before we had fancy computing tools like your graphing calculators, for example, that could easily fit curves and figure out what the mathematical relationship was, what scientists used to do was they would play around with different variables and plot them on the x and y axis until they found something that made a nice linear fit. And what they found out with this particular set of variables is that if you put the natural log of vapor pressure on the y-axis and you put the inverse of absolute temperature on the x-axis, you would get a straight line relationship. So here's a picture of that. The natural log of vapor pressure versus the inverse of temperature, absolute temperature, turns out to be linear. And so you can see that these three curves that we had have now become lines when we plot them this way. So this elucidates the relationship 
This makes it clear what the relationship is. Well, what's the equation of a line? The equation of a line is y equals mx plus b. So in that case, we could say, since y is natural log of vapor pressure, that's equal to a slope, m, times x, which in this case is 1 over temperature, plus b, some constant. This relationship is called the Clausius-Clapeyron relationship, named after two physicists who were really into thermodynamics uh, in the 1800s that came up with this relationship. And it turns out that the slope of that line is related to two quantities that we know. One of them is the molar heat of vaporization of the substance, and the other one is R, which is odd because this doesn't necessarily have anything much to do with the gas laws, but there's that number R. And we're going to find out that R shows up again and again. It's a number like pi or E that just seems to be slipping in in places where it doesn't belong, but it makes sense. It turns out that the, experimentally, when you determine this, delta HVAP over R, the opposite of that is equal to the slope of the clausius clapeyron equation. Now, molar heats of vaporization are given in, in units of energy like joules per mole, and this would have to then match in joules per mole Kelvin, and so we use the 8.314 R here in this equation. Now you don't want to have to plot this out to have to find out what the y-intercept is, so I want to develop for you a two-point form of this equation that might be much more useful for solving problems. All right, so starting out from this standpoint of the clausius clapeyron equation, I want to get rid of C is what I want to do. I want to get rid of that somehow. So one way that I can think of doing that is taking two different points. Like, for example, let's say I had the natural log of one pressure, P1 I'll call it, that would be equal to minus delta HVAP over R times 1 over T1, the temperature at which we have that P1 vapor pressure, plus the y-intercept of the line. Now, if I subtracted this equation, but at a different temperature and pressure, I would also be subtracting C and getting rid of it. So I'll do that. So minus natural log of P2 equals minus delta H VAP over R times 1 over T2 this time plus C. When I do my subtraction, here's what I get. C goes away, which was my objective. And I get natural log of P1 minus natural log of P2 equals minus delta H VAP over R times 1 over T1 minus minus delta H VAP over R times 1 over T2. If I factor out minus delta H VAP over R, I could rewrite this this way. I could say natural log of P1 over P2, because remember that identity of natural logs, is equal to minus delta H VAP over R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. So that would be a two-point form of the clausius clapeyron equation. Or sometimes it's written this way natural log of P1 over P2 equals minus delta H VAP over R times T2 minus T1 over T1 times T2. So either one of these equations might be more useful in different circumstances, but that's the two-point form of this law. Because we've introduced dynamic equilibrium in this chapter, we can also talk about something that's related to it that we're going to come back to again. It's called Le Chatelier's Principle. Le Chatelier's Principle says this, when you're at dynamic equilibrium with some system and you disturb that system in some way, the system will respond in a way that tends to restore equilibrium. In other words, tries to get it back to where it was before. So applying this to a phase change, we could say this, that if we have liquid and we add heat, we will get vapor. We could write down that equation, but it's a reversible equation. So if we were to add heat, if we were to add a bunch of heat to a liquid, 
that's in equilibrium with vapor, we would get less liquid and more vapor because it would cause it to shift this way. Disturbing this system by adding a reactant, which is what heat essentially is here, causes it to use that reactant up and get back to where it was before by using up liquid, creating more vapor, but getting rid of the heat. By the same token, if we put this in a cold place and took away heat, <clears throat> the system would shift in a way that produced more heat to make up for the lost heat. It always tries to undo the stress. So in that situation, we would shift backwards and vapor would condense into liquid to give us back some heat. That's Le Chatelier's principle. And I'm not going to say much more about Le Chatelier's principle at this point, but just to introduce it in this simple way in phase change so that later on when we see it in chemical change, you'll have a better understanding because you've seen it once before. That might also help us understand something called phase diagrams. I'm going to use water as an example and explain the features of a phase diagram here. A phase diagram is really a graphical model of the boundaries between the phases or states on the pressure temperature space. So I've got pressure on the y-axis and I have temperature in degrees Celsius in this case on the x-axis. Now one very important feature of a phase diagram is something called the triple point. The triple point is right in the middle here. The triple point is the temperature and pressure at which all three states are in equilibrium with each other. So for water, it looks like that's 0 0.0098 Celsius for a temperature and a pressure of 0 0.0060 atmospheres. If you have those conditions, you can have solid, liquid, and gas water all in the same container at equilibrium with each other. But there's only one temperature and pressure at which that's true. Now moving on from that triple point, we can see some boundaries. One of the boundaries is the boundary between solid and gas. So going back on this line here, we see that boundary established. Any place on that point is where you're at dynamic equilibrium between solid and gas. So if I were to start out here at some very low pressure like 0 0.0004, and I were to move up in temperature, what would happen is I would cross from solid into gas. So this would be a sublimation process here. If I go up from the triple point and head up this line, I see the interface between liquid and gas. So let's say I'm at one atmosphere right here. As I move across here, I cross that curve right at 100 degrees C, not a coincidence again, that's the boiling point, because that's what would be happening here and I move into the gas phase. So this is vaporization that I've just traced out as I went across that boundary. But the liquid gas interface can happen here, it can happen here, it can happen here, it can happen anywhere on that curve. You might have recognized that the curve that we have right here, that's the graph that we saw previously when we established what boiling point was. It's just part of a bigger picture, and that bigger picture is the phase diagram. Now here's something interesting about water. The interface between solid and liquid happens to slope back a little bit and to the left. Here's what that means. If you pick a temperature, like this temperature right here, whatever that temperature is, and you increase the pressure on the solid, it will melt. It will go into the liquid phase. That's not true for very many substances. Water is about the only one of very common substances that that occurs for. Most substances have that graph slope the other way. So in most cases we have liquids that are less dense than the solid. For water it's just the other way around. Compressing a liquid usually freezes it, but in the case of water compressing the solid melts it. This is what happens underneath skate blades and skis. As you glide along on that solid surface the compression of the weight sitting on it melts a thin layer and you slide on that thin layer of water. Just an ex as an example of how almost everything else behaves, here's the triple point right there and the solid gas and the liquid gas interfaces look about the same but the difference is that solid liquid line. For almost every substance, here we see carbon dioxide, the solid liquid line slopes to the right. And so what that means is if I start out at some temperature here as a liquid, 
and I compress it by making the pressure higher, I'm going to cross over into the solid phase. There's one other feature on phase diagrams that I should point out, and that's the critical point right there. After you hit that point, which for carbon dioxide is 31 Celsius, it's no longer possible to have a separate gas and liquid phase. And so this boundary becomes very blurred. And up here, over that higher than that point, you have only something that's called a supercritical fluid. Super means above, so it means it's above the critical point. Supercritical fluid exists there. Uh, in carbon dioxide, actually, the supercritical fluid has a important commercial use. It turns out that caffeine dissolves particularly well in supercritical carbon dioxide. And so one non-toxic way to get caffeine out of coffee is to soak the beans in supercritical carbon dioxide. The caffeine dissolves and it gets pulled out and then you can just flush it away and let it vaporize. Just more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere.